we thank you all for giving up your evening or morning or whichever time of the day it is to come and hear me prattle on for a little bit. Um, so without further ado, I'll share uh, the slides and we can proceed. <coughs> so if we will respond. There we go. Uh, so British troops in Japan, uh, 1864 to 1875, highlighting the thin red line around Yokohama. Um, <coughs> Again, my details there, academia links and others. Um, but I've looked through the names here and I know one or two of you. If any of you want to get in touch, feel free to email me or yes, contact me, contact me through academia. Um, again, as I will say, I'm very, very keen to have feedback. Um, again, the project's been going for some time, but of course, due to um, the disrupted world in which we live at the moment, uh, my particular part of it, uh, this particular project, um, this particular area of research. Um, well, I, I think it's doing relatively well, but I'm always interested in hearing from my peers, of course. Uh, so again, as, as was mentioned, um, a lot of my research to date has been about the Allied occupation of Japan <clears throat> post-war. Um, and this is something of a departure, but also links back to other elements of what I've looked at before. So um, peacetime military links between like really Anglo-American or Western military forces and Japan. Um, yeah, and again, as was mentioned, uh, I'm leading this GSPS project um, on, well, peacetime military links between the two, Japan and the United Kingdom. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so an edited volume in the in the works. Uh, again, conference panels also upcoming this year on this with me and some of the other fellow contributors. Um, again, hopefully a monograph on this topic in particular from myself. And again, a, an ongoing research and practitioner network is something that we're looking to produce and work through. So again, there's a bit of background. So disclaimer, again, this is a not the first presentation I've done exactly on this topic, but it's the first one of any real length. Um, and again, as the organizers know, uh, my particular situation has been disrupted somewhat heavily over the last few weeks in particular. But again, of course, for all of us over the last year or so, um, archival research, travel and various other things have been somewhat disrupted. Uh, particularly in this case, materials access, the National Archives, again, other locations and the regimental museums I wanted to visit and collect material from have been closed, so difficult to do so. Um, again, there's more to do, there's more to collect. Um, and again, hopefully we'll get there soon enough. So as I said, questions and comments are most welcome. Okay, so the abstract, um, I suppose we should read that for formality purposes. So between 1864 and 1875, thousands of British troops resided in the purpose block garrison on the slopes overlooking Yokohama. Despite forming the majority of the permanent foreign community for years and being central to many events and developments during their residence, the history of the garrison has been almost entirely unexamined in English. Within accounts of the era, the black, white and grey tones of diplomacy of the diplomacy aspect or diplomatic aspect shine through and the glitter of the silver, gold and copper of the economic links are reflected. But the dash, <coughs> the dash of red, then prominent in the landscape, has faded into the background. This paper seeks to argue the significance of the British garrison has been underrated or understated within studies of the period and seeks to restore their visibility within the scholarship. Alongside highlighting the roles they played within a volatile and dynamic era of Japanese history, uh, a number of fresh perspectives and interpretations based on hither to unemployed primary sources will be presented. Okay, so the structure of what we will look at. Um, again, historiography, a little note on the kind of excellent scholarship on this topic, uh, the significance, importance of it. Um, again, some notes on participants' accounts. Then we'll go into a kind of over overview of this force, this garrison. So their arrival, <clears throat> um, some of the events, I suppose, or the kind of life of them in the country, their comings and goings. Um, the times when they were actually used um, as combat troops, which, you know, one or two, not huge, but again, still notable. 
Um, again, the other security type aspects of their position, um, of their role, uh, then I'll make some commentary about their position within British policy. Uh, then the size and economic influence of the force, um, which is another <coughs> part of their existence that hasn't been examined so much. Uh, I'll, a brief mention of drill or training influences that they exerted, again, indirectly more than directly. <coughs> Uh, followed by a brief comment about um, leisure and cultural influences, then sovereignty, and then I'll look at the withdrawal and legacies of the force. Okay, where are we? Um, again, as I mentioned, um, projects ongoing. We've got more elements to look at, uh, more elements being developed of this. And some of these here, if you're interested, I'll go through briefly. So, um, a detailed examination of the first person accounts, um, both of their experiences, of course, as part of the garrison and their views of Japan, etc., and how these maybe potentially influence views back in Britain um, through reflecting what is generally a pretty positive image of, of, of Japan through their writings. Um, again, I very much like to find and examine um, some more Japanese accounts of the troops. There are some, there's some sort of newspaper accounts, but Again, and obviously discussion within the shogunate, uh, Han and others, of their role, of their position to an extent. Um, I'm also looking into the social history of the garrison. So, of course, how they lived, how they ate, what their, how their soldierly routines were adapted or not to life in Japan. Um, Again, a more general overview of the kind of organizational culture of the Marines and the British Army at this stage. Uh, I think it's also relevant, so it'll form part of the, the structure of this hopefully book length project by the time it's finished. Another key element will be, again, the crime and punishment side. So, again, individuals under military justice, um, again, also simultaneously and the kind of extraterritoriality. But also involved, as we will see, in kind of policing the settlement. Um, and again, we have sort of well, both court records, of course, but um, again, the court martial records we're looking to delve into related to this. And of course, some of these crimes, unfortunately, involve the locals as well. Um, further thing to look at is the health. So again, there's outbreaks of cholera, different, you know, epidemics, I suppose. Um, amongst the garrison and then you know spreading between them and the local community again there's also kind of deep well instance or maybe sort of endemic nature of sexually transmitted disease between both the garrison and elements of the local population so again these are examinable through the medical records the surgeons records and others so another element to be examined um, and lastly although the character differs very significantly, of course, from the occupation in the post-war years. Um, one question I'm thinking about and looking at these days relate to this is whether we could consider this a form of occupation. Um, again, you have space being occupied, you have troops present who control this territory, not entirely to the exclusion of the, the local government, but it's certainly under their influence and control. So um, again, Brown did a study of what is military occupation, you could argue under some of his demo definitions, this is a form of that. Um, of course, they're nowhere near the scale and nowhere near the depth of influence, of course, of the post-war occupation. So um, some commentary anyway about the existent accounts. Um, so Japanese accounts, there's a bit more attention being paid to this in Japanese, really. Also, well, I'd say a lot more, to be honest, in Japanese than there is in English. Um, although the best and mo maybe most comprehensive account, although it does have significant flaws, it was produced in 1957 and again, reissued several times subsequently in the 70s. Um, yeah, by Hora Tomio. Um, I'll come to some issues with that later on, but there's other things produced by the Yokohama Archives of History, sort of edited guide or partial documentary history, came out in 1993. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, another edited volume produced by the Yokohama Foreign Relations History Study Group and the Yokohama Archives of History. 
and 2011, a book by Ishizuka, kind of quasi-academic, quasi-popular book, um, which is basically a kind of rehash of his chapter and then uh, the 1999 book with some additional materials talking about not directly related things to this topic. Um, again, we've got inside of these volumes, all of them actually, some inaccuracies, some inconsistencies, uh, numbers, composition, and some of this you might say is, well, there's various reasons, again, we'll come back to why this is, but um, a principal reason is they don't use, and it's forgivable, of course, because they don't have access to it at certain stages. Although the more recent ones, there's not really so much of an excuse, but um, they don't really use the primary material. So the records of the Royal Marines Japan Battalion, for example, um, again, they don't look into some of the regimental records which could have given them this information in a bit more detail. So there's a bit of a gap here, even though things have been published on this, they're not exactly, uh, well, either comprehensive or fully kind of examining such. So on the non-Japanese side, there's even more of a gap. So there's no dedicated work in English that I've discovered or even heard of. Um, again, of course, lots of names here there's lots of others we can include of course studying different aspects of anglo-japanese relations um in this era so bakamatsu meiji um, again looking at park sato all the various different other individuals and characters on the diplomatic side um but none of them well none of these works looks at this force really in any detail there's sort of some asides or some comments some footnotes more often than not that's all you see some footnotes on this um, but certainly no dedicated work of any kind. Um, again, there's some more focus on the military aspects in French scholarship, in French studies. Um, of course, Jules Brunet and French military mission later on and other elements there being quite prominent in French relations. Um, but really, again, not much. Well, very, I mean, nothing I've managed to find, although I'm not, despite my name, a French speaker. Um, anything about this in the French scholarship really in any detail either, um, although there is an upcoming EAGS panel which doesn't directly cover this but has some focus on the military aspects of relations at this stage between France and the Shogunate and the later imperial government of course. <clears throat> so in summary no works really deal with the force directly, um, at least in English and they don't examine it in many cases or there's no sort of single monograph length piece i mean uh, horror's work is a chapter there's no kind of book length piece on this um again from arrival through history to legacies again using relevant primary sources at least in english so again there's space well reasons for neglect um again there's not First of all, I suppose huge numbers of people working on these sort of subjects uh, these days. Um, but again, diplomatic economic subjects related to this get a bit more attention. Um, again, the garrison is viewed by those maybe who well, again know of its existence. I don't think Beasley even mentions it in major restoration um, that I've seen so far. Uh, it's seen as kind of obviously a background or functionary thing, not as important and not as significant as, of course, other elements of the negotiation or, again, just a background to those negotiations. Um, a tinge of red as black put it in the landscape. Um, another issue here is that the active influence of this force is obviously somewhat notable, I would say, but the passive influences, as we'll see, maybe are a bit more significant. So measuring those, judging those can be something which, how should we say, uh, they could be difficult to quantify, depending on how you want to frame such. So again, perhaps that's one of the issues. Um, again, language issues, potentially, again, some of the material, some of the Japanese accounts don't use a great deal in in English. And again, as I've said, they don't really use, well, virtually anything from uh, the main records, Admiralty and others. So yeah, there's shortcomings there. Um, 
Although, again, that's not entirely necessarily the fault of the individuals involved, because some of these sources are quite obscure. Um, again, there's material available directly relating to this that's scattered all over the UK in different regimental archives, again, some of which I think has been lost. There's one in particular archive, which I know did potentially hold material in this, but it's been with a move of museum and again, a defunding of a lot of these regimental museums, it's, um, they can't locate it. So sadly it's been lost. Um, so yeah, some of this stuff is not that easy to find. And again, even when you do think something's present, the, how should we say, there's differing levels of organization, differing levels of, um, management of archives in these museums which again can make matters even more challenging in certain forms. Uh, another reason for neglect I suppose we can move on to is unlike the diplomats of course a, a large chunk of their profession is well alongside talking to people writing to people and discussing things through written records which of course survive to this day. Um, when you're dealing with this garrison you're dealing with a group of individuals who are in a what we might call non-literary culture. Um, again, study of this era, you know, Victorian army is kind of not something which is, how should we say, looked on particularly favorably. Um, again, a big chunk of the men in particular are illiterate, entirely literate, 20% around this era. I think it's only about 7% who have received anything more than about you know, what we'd probably consider to be middle school education. Um, and again, the officers are, are, are all more or less literate. Um, but again, very few of those have any interest in reading as a pastime and certainly writing things as a pastime. They're all very much into games and sports and such, as we'll come back to later. So we don't see a huge amount of material surviving or again, recorded accounts, although we do have three, which we will mention um, next, I think, or very soon. Um, so in terms of the relevance of this topic, in terms of its um, timeliness, I don't know whether that's the right word or not, but we do see similar things coming through. I mentioned the panel, of course, EJS about upcoming panel about French military or involving papers on French military links. Um, again, Robert Fletcher's work on the Richardson slash Namamugi incident, um, again, came out recently. There's also trends in the scholarship or trends in, um, well, the study of history, I suppose, that also connect to this. So scholarship on non-literate, non-elites within empire. Again, scholarship on imperial soldiering. Um, again, the sort of social history of administration of empire. So um, Auerbach talking about cultural influences, again, imperial boredom, various other things. Uh, again, development of theories, again, development of historical analyses of occupation, of frontier spaces, technology, knowledge transfer, other things also developing. So again, this topic also sort of connects and links into lots of these. Um, so by way of summary, again, just to kind of close off this section, um, there's no single work really that exists on this topic in English. Um, and I'm attempting to kind of fill that gap here. So a full analysis um, from the context of their arrival, their presence, the reasons why. Um, again, their life in Yokohama, their usage, both passive and active, their influences, their departure, their legacies, and again, interpretations of various different elements that I'm trying to examine here. And again, as I said several times already, um, the thing which maybe adds something here beyond the accounts which do exist is a more extensive use of the primary documents, including lots of which have never been examined before. Um, so regimental materials, unused national archive materials, military, of course, medical discipline, administrative, etc. cetera. Um, so a brief note on participants accounts. There are three. Um, 
points, which is the one on the left, per mile per terum. Again, Royal Marines Light Infantry Officer Major. Um, again, this one deals with a lot of the kind of admin or operational aspects. So he's the only one of these three that's really ever cited by anybody, and that's normally to do with his points about Shimos Shimonoseki, the action of the Marines and Naval Brigade uh, at Shimonoseki. Uh, there's Our Life in Japan by Jepson and Elmshurst, Elmhurst, I'm sorry, of the 9th Regiment. Um, again, latterly the Norfolk Regiment, Royal Norfolk Regiment. Again, theirs is very horsey um, and very uh, focused on the leisure side. So it's basically an account of like our life fox hunting in Japan more than anything else. Our life hunting the local wildlife to extinction in Japan. Um, yeah, very much focused on the leisure. Horse racing, um, riding to hounds, shooting, and all these other pursuits which officers undertake, of course, as part of their lifestyle um, in this era. Last, and again, the shortest of the three is Silver. Um, again, Lieutenant Royal Marines Light Infantry. Um, again, something rare here that you have a, a Lieutenant who has interest in the culture around him in detail. Of course, the other two make some commentary about it, but again, this is devoted exclusively pretty much to a analysis, if you can call it that, or his view of such. Um, so again, the three have some usefulness, again, certainly in terms of their perspectives and the events they recount. Um, and they also are useful in terms of their, as I've said, differing perspectives. So sort of action or usage, the more military side, the leisure side, and again, the interaction with the local culture, or again, cultural perspectives of the, the force involved. Okay, so yeah, arrival is next. Um, why is this force present in Japan and why does it appear? And why does it stay for so long? I suppose we'll come to it later, but um, yeah, why is it here? Why does it rock up on the shores of Japan in 1864? Um, well, from the opening of Japan, again, after the kind of presence of, well, foreign, the foreign settlement or foreign presence in Yokohama in particular, um, also elsewhere, though, you know, from the late 1850s through, you get the occasional landings of Marines and sailors. Um, again, Hall mentions Russians, um, Prussians being landed at different stages to I mean, the Russian cases, again, like several of these are obviously related to the murder of a Russian um, sea captain, I think he is. Uh, and what's done is, you know, forces are put on shore to kind of show strength and also well, deter such actions. Um, but it's informal, it's temporary. They come, they kind of march around, they show their presence and then they leave again, go back on ship and sail away. Uh, the beginnings of a more permanent presence um, stem from, again, insecurity here. So there's a, two attacks on the British legation towards NG. Um, yeah, the first of which is very serious indeed. It almost results in a, well, death of you know, major diplomatic figures um, involved, at least in that legation. And after that, um, Royal Marines are stationed to protect it alongside, of course, the um, guards appointed by the shogunate to do so, who aren't entirely trusted. But you've got a small force around, I think it's 25, 30 Marines posted to protect um, the legation. Again, they're the victims of the second attack um, when that occurs on the gates of the legation. So kind of the theme here again is this insecurity uh, as the context for the presence of these forces, that um, both the movement to expel the foreigners, um, and of course, after this, into you know, 1863, for um, actual edicts to do so that are enacted, albeit reluctantly by the shogunate, and maybe not really enacted, but you know, the hand is forced, it heightens that level of security. Um, Again, other events, level of insecurity, I'm sorry. 
other events such as, of course, the murder um, of Richardson, the Namurugi incident and its aftermath. Of course, involving the attack on Kagoshima, bombardment of Kagoshima, um, sort of kicks off a period of very high tension indeed through 1863, 1864. And there's repeated calls by the foreign community onshore and again, request back to London, etc., for, or again, to regional outposts. So over to, uh, you know, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and others, for troops to be sent to defend the settlement. Um, through the course of 1863, 1864, Britain and France assert the right to defend the settlement um, in talks or, well, through communications directly and sort of indirectly. Um, with the shogunate and also eventually to have troops present. 1863, a small number of French troops arrive um, and build a, a camp. Um, the British garrison arrives 1864 um, and the shogunate constructs a barracks for them not too long after. So they are kind of more or less permanently, well, they are permanently present after that point. We can argue whether this is necessary um, again, Horror argues that the U UK's commercial interest impels it to act, of course, imperialistically in this case and demands an aggressive policy, as he puts it. Um, I think it's perhaps more convincing to argue that the, you know, persistent insecurity, again, the murders of their citizens, um, and the inability or unwillingness of the shogunate to deal with that the expulsion edicts and others and the norms of international relations in the 19th century kind of demand the presence of these troops. Um, it's something which, how should we say, is, well, relatively common occurrence. We're going to intervene to protect our citizens, especially if they come under attack or are killed. So it's, how should we say, I don't think it's so connected to commercial interest as horror might argue. Uh, or did argue. It's more kind of the, the way the game's played in the 19th century. Um, and again, the murders of these individuals in particular. So a timeline, again, I won't talk through this because it's obviously somewhat complex, um, but yeah, different units moving in and out of the country, um, 1864, red of course for British and blue for French. Um, 1864 for the British, of course, and 1863 for the French. Um, again, the Marines, Royal, well, later Royal Marines, but yeah, Royal Marine Light Infantry. Um, present at the start and the end, again, a mix of different units in the middle. So the 67th Regiment, the 20th, the 11th, the 9th, the 10th. Um, again, detachments of Royal Artillery, the Royal Engineers, and the Ballot Regiment, or Ballot Regiment. Um, so yeah, rotated in and out. Again, numbers changing over time, gradually reducing after a very high peak in 1864, um, but present all the way through until 1875, when both the British and French troops leave permanently. Uh, again, we have a garrison photo here. So Beto, one of his, um, this is the Royal Marines, again, with a Balloch regiment in the middle. Um, again, the Royal Artillery Detachments on either side. And in the back, you've got the barrack huts and also the, well, less permanent uh, tent kind of accommodation for the troops. Again, the barracks are constructed um, because, again, if we look back briefly at the previous slide, um, if it will have been, uh, the green part of the top is a cholera outbreak and the sort of Incidents of this is blamed upon unsanitary kind of accommodation. And there's a very heavy stress put on to the shogunate to produce, um, how should we say, healthier living conditions or healthier living, um, well, units, I suppose, housing, um, and such is then constructed, uh, as we can see behind. So action, uh, the active use of these troops. Well, the most active, um, the most notable usage is the Shimonoseki, camp Shimonoseki campaign. Um, 
again, we, this is not an image directly of their involvement, of course, this is the bombardment um, by the kind of allied fleet, but they are the ones that go on shore, they're the ones that fight against the stockade um, of Chosho troops. Um, again, Point says that it's not a huge action, but it, it is it's intense for what it is, and again, it's larger than, he says, uh, a number of different actions that are fought elsewhere which are awarded medals, service medals. Again, several Victoria Crosses awarded for the action in Shimonoseki, although none of which go to the actual uh, garrison here, it's the sailors. Um, they're also involved in the Kobe incident, so this is kind of an attack on the assembled diplomatic corps in Kobe, uh, not long after it's opened. Yeah, and they, you know, certain elements of the garrison are present and they help to kind of drive off the troops that have attacked, I think, from Hizen province. Um, again, they're also present on a number of the attacks or assassination attempts on Harry Parks uh, during his presence or during his time of courses all the way through to the 1880s, but these attacks stop uh, in uh, the early 1870s. Um, but yeah, they're there, again, involved. Again, they're also used uh, in the Kobe incident and also later in sort of temporary fortifications that are thrown up uh, first around Yokohama and again, close to Kobe. Um, so that's the active use. Um, I would argue the passive impact of their presence is also important and notable. So deterrence. Um, Again, versus what Oslin and others have called this of terrorism of attacks by, uh, well, Ronin and, you know, there's different terms that can be used uh, against the foreign community. Um, again, actions to prevent direct attack potentially against the settlement by pro-expulsion forces. Um, again, as I'll mention later, you could argue that the presence of the garrison actually prevents greater military involvement later in that it arguably prevents further aggressive actions towards the foreign community which may have resulted in larger conflict um, although we're into kind of speculation I suppose there um, other passive roles I suppose or roles of the garrison invol involving security are they kind of police or patrol inside the foreign settlement. Uh, they guard the gates. Um, again, this is not for the entire time they're present, but um, yeah, they are certainly directly involved in that, actually alongside the Japanese guards. Um, they're also involved in kind of fire fighting. Um, again, including the Great Fire of Yokohama in this period. Um, although again, they're there's accounts of them being slightly, or some of them being slightly true to type in terms of looting being involved. Uh, while they're meant to be fighting such fires, they rob certain properties. So uh, touches of Hakeswell and such in the mix. Um, right, so how does this connect then to British strategy and policy? Again, the image on the right here is the attack on the stockade in um, Shimonoseki, Naval Brigade and Marines. So the garrison forms, I would argue, a key tool or potential tool of the British legation. Um, again, the usage of Japan as a kind of military base had been envisaged even you know, way back um, during the kind of earliest connections and links that are being made. So Sterling arguing in 1859, um, well, envisaging, again, it doesn't really go too far, but his idea is that you know, use Japan as part of a maritime kind of power base across the region through using bases. Um, that, of course, doesn't happen. There's discontinuity there, but the idea is present. Um, again, the forces are present, and m many of the, the elements of the garrison which come over come from China. Um, and again, from Harry Parks through to various different other experiences, certain, you know, cultural miscues about the necessity of having armed force to back up negotiations are taken. Um, and again, Daniels talks about, for example, quasi-military diplomacy being used by Parks and others. Um, 
against Japan or with Japan. This though is sort of tempered in another sense by Parks's reluctance to use these forces and you know orders that are received of course from London not to use them except for defensive purposes. Um, again Neil reluctant to do so draw the country into a war again. Um, this all fits with a kind of minimalist position of Britain at this stage, you could argue, of uh, trying to acquire or not trying to acquire any more territory in East Asia. Um, but there's a necessity to maintain troops in the region somewhere. So ongoing unrest, again, ongoing possibilities of their use in China. So the Taiping Rebellion, of course, is going along during this period, um, potential for further involvement in China against the government or other forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, as we will mention later, there's value from having troops in Japan and monetary value from doing that, which I think is next. Um, so the presence of these troops adds, or you might say heft to the negotiating hand of Parks and others, it adds weight. Um, of course, prestige, trade concerns, other matters, again, dealing with rivals, US, France, Russia, the presence of these troops give Britain, gives Britain more of a say. Um, of course, Britain is the hegemonic power in this time, in this era. But again, the direct local presence of, of course, these troops alongside the Royal Navy, uh, China Station, or warships coming in and out adds power behind the words, of course, of Parks and others. Um, Interesting, and as again, I'll mention in different forms as we go through into later stages of this. Um, you could argue that the presence of the garrison also has, I won't say beneficial impact on the shogunate, but it has value in a way. It helps the foreigners look after themselves, as it were, rather than bringing the shogunate into, well, more responsibility for doing that and then being held responsible if things occur um, prevents incidents embarrassments potentially intervention um, and ultimately again the garrison has its value in terms of a card that can be played later on um, when dealing with a major government of withdrawal um, it's something that can be drawn out um, and then you know taken away to you know finesse other negotiations later. Um, again, as I'll mention, the, the major government is slightly more irritated, shall we say, by the presence of these forces than the shogunate, but I suppose the shogunate's got bigger problems to deal with most of the time. A final thing to mention is the value for money here. Um, again, as I've mentioned, the shogunate constructs the garrison, constructs the, the buildings, uh, the housing, uh, again, there's value here too that this is a, or is considered to be by both the, the soldiers and the officers, and is, I think, statistically as well, a safer place for them to reside as compared to Hong Kong or Shanghai. Um, again, less incidents of disease. Um, again, there's certain regiments involved in this garrison have very high mortality indeed in Hong Kong. Um, of course, cholera outbreaks in, in this particular garrison. Um, again, there's a vast, as I said, endemic situation of uh, sexually transmitted infections, but the numbers of individuals dying um, of disease, and again, the cost, of course, of replacing them and you know the, the toll on operational effectiveness and things that is taken by that isn't really comparable in terms of scale to Hong Kong. Um, so it's seen as like a useful place to store the troops, as it were, um, in case of usage either in Japan or elsewhere. And uh, there's also the financial advantages directly that um, accrue from presence here, which we'll come to next. So important point to note, and I think, again, another thing that stresses the importance of this force is that um, they form the majority of the quote unquote resident or permanent population of the Treaty port. Okay, certain points there are five times the population of diplomats and traders. Um, so 1863, 1864, vastly more troops present than there are 
permanent residents. Of course, there's traders and people coming and going all the time, sailors and others coming and going. But yeah, the core people who are there for more than a few days at a time or more than more than a few weeks at a time are vastly, the vast, vast majority are this garrison. Um, again, there's still a majority of the population until 1871-ish. So there are economic, I suppose you might say dividends or certainly perceived economic dividends by some of their present. So the increased sense of security, I suppose the general stability to an extent increasing, um, leads to, well, a growth of a settlement. Oh, look, and there's lots of other reasons why it grows. It's not just this, but this adds the kind of basis of security behind it. And again, the confidence of foreign traders to, well, move in and trade and you know, stay. Um, again, in terms of direct financial benefits, though, as I mentioned previously, uh, these troops benefit from the Ichibu exchange. So this is a, a very fa uh, uh, favorable exchange rate of, well, their wages into Japanese currency uh, coinage. So eventually this is sort of institutionalized where the regiment's president will take their entire pay down and convert it into Japanese currency and then get a huge benefit back. Um, later on, the kind of profit, as it were, from doing this is, you know, saved by the regiments and used for their, um, the welfare of the troops, again, for their entertainment and various other things. But yeah, it's certainly something which saves expense uh, and puts a lot of money in the pockets of, well, the garrison itself who then proceed to spend it of course in the port generating demand generating custom um, again generating income so again direct contribution to economic growth there as well okay so drill and training next um, so what surprised me isn't looking at some of these documents is actually for big chunks of the 19th century, a lot of British army troops and Marines, I suppose, don't actually train very often. Um, again, there's a sort of accounts of certain regiments in London. I mean, I suppose they're the guards, so they don't really normally go off to fight very often in the course of the 19th century. But being issued, I think it's like 30 rounds of practice ammunition, or ammunition to practice with every three months for each soldier. So what's that one shot every three days or something along those lines um again here the case though is somewhat different um i wouldn't say they're drilled intensively but they certainly take it seriously they certainly practice seriously they're certainly firing more than um you know one shot every three days or whatever it would be so you could argue this indicates that they're taking preparation seriously and they're taking the possibility of action seriously so something to note um in terms of training and drill um the influence of this force or again british you know infantry doctrine i suppose or british infantry methods on the japanese has been sort of played down in lots of accounts um i would argue maybe it's a bit more substantial than has been recognized but again it's indirect so well, one evidence of the, how should we say, potential impact and potential interest um, was that the Japanese, or the shogunate, I suppose, their first choice was to use British instructors. Um, they ask and give a formal request for such um, to the British government, although the British government takes so long to reply that the shogunate asks the French in the meantime and feels that it can't withdraw its offer or you know its um, request which is accepted by the French once the British then reply later. So this moves again Parks and others to suggest instead well why don't we help you with your navy instead. Um, so again a misstep or again the lateness in the British response kind of push um, British assistance in a more naval direction than army. Um, although there are still of course British trainers used. Again, you've got later missions, the Douglas mission and others. Um, again, one of the members of the garrison, um, Lieutenant Hawes, Royal Marine Artillery is taken on um, and again, plays an early role in what becomes eventually the 
development of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Um, so a lot of this is relatively well known, but what's less examined is the influence well, I suppose some of it is direct, but also indirect of the garrison itself. So both in Our Life in Japan and Per Mar, Per Terum, <clears throat> uh, the authors talk about being asked to kind of informally teach um, military students coming from the shogunate and being dispatched, some of which have been chosen because they speak English fluently or relatively well. Um, and that going on. Again, I think Points talks about being offered a role instructing the shogun army himself by them you know why don't you resign and come and join us and teach us um so this kind of informal instruction is going on already um behind the scenes prior to kind of formal contract being signed as it were between the two sides um, you also see a number of numerous kind of joint parades even exercises or kind of sham fights as they are termed going on between the garrison and the Japanese troops guarding Yokohama. So they're maneuvering them, kind of having a kind of fake battle against one another. Um, and again, taking it relatively seriously, there's people who get seriously injured doing this. Um, again, points and the authors of Our Life also observe, again, troops at Satsuma showing they've kind of used British drill or they think that's what they're doing or the, the you know, evolutions of that being shown to them on a visit. Um, again, there's accounts of Satsuma troops using British drill in action later on, um, but this is indirect. So you've got drill book translations of, um, again, British platoon drill and others that have made their way through and been translated over into Japanese. And it's through these that it's likely that this knowledge moved over. Um, again, one of these is collected by one of the participants of the members of the garrison, uh, Lieutenant Bruce, and sent back to the kind of head of the army as a souvenir, saying a Japanese translation of British drill book. Um, again, the garrison demonstrates, or is asked to demonstrate drill and different you know, actions um in an audience with the shogunate at one stage so again it's there the presence is there of course the french take over later and then the germans after them um in subsequent years in terms of military instruction for the imperial military in particular but britain is there at the start and this garrison has a role inside of that um so leisure and cultural influences um so officers in the the British Army, and again, I suppose to a lesser extent, the Royal Marines, in this era have a large amount of free time. Um, there's certain instances of people having up to, at least in the UK, you know, 250 days leave a year to go fox hunting or hunting of other kinds. Um, again, day to day, they don't really have a lot to do with their men, uh, except for maybe the, the colonel and the adjutant and various others. They're dealing with matters and the rest of the officers are well, at leisure most of the time. Um, and what they're very much into is, alongside drinking and other forms of nighttime entertainment, um, again, entertaining in their mess and other things, is sport or other kind of cultural activities. So it's central to their lives. It's both also central to our lives of their men. Uh, some say, you know, the only thing that really keeps them together or they have in common is a kind of a love for their regiment and also a taste for sport. So this is one element where we can see a clear and important influence of this garrison. So the centrality to treaty port life um, for the foreign community, again, the social sphere of, well, practices which the garrison introduce, introduces or is very, very heavily involved in is the kind of core element in. So sports, rugby, cricket, um, again, fox hunting, horse racing, again, the image on the right, um, there's certain stakes of that, certain races being run, uh, entirely made up of members of the garrison. Again, virtually all of the people running it, the administration is done by members of the garrison. 
um, again, sports days, other kinds of sort of running races and other things, wrestling matches and entertainments of other forms, sports days conducted. Um, again, target range constructed for practice. Again, eventually it evolves into the kind of Yokohama Rifle Club. Again, the Yokohama race course, of course, we have here. Um, again, hunting, you know, with not with dogs and horses, but with firearms. Again, also a major pastime. Again, occasional incidents related to this as the local population of pheasants and various other things are, well, made extinct. Um, encroachment outside of the area permitted for presence of foreigners uh, occasionally occurs, and this results in issues later on in the Meiji period. Um, Garrison Theatre, again, the first sort of Western style theatrical productions in Japan are put on by sailors and again the soldiers of this garrison. So, again, one of the origins of that. Again, there's religious legacy, Christchurch in uh, Yokohama, Yamate is a kind of direct outgrowth of the presence of the garrison itself. Um, also notable is music. So virtually all of the ceremonial functions in the settlement, the musical accompaniment on background is provided by, well, the bands of these regiments. So the funerals um, of different people, especially when they're murdered or you know, attacked or whatever else. Um, Again, music at the sort of race course, race days is provided, um, although not all of the regiments have a full band. Some just have pipes and drums. Uh, of course, notable here is Fenton, um, bandmaster of one of the regiments who's later employed by actually both the Japanese and Imperial Korean governments to write their national anthem or write the musics for their na national anthem, at least in the Japanese case. So cultural legacies, cultural um products again product uh you know re results or products of what our batch would call you know this sort of imperial boredom um they have a lot of free time they don't have a lot to do so they amuse themselves doing well the things that they used to do or used to doing um back home and introduce some of those sports and practices into uh, japan okay so sovereignty next um Horror's work, again, very critical of their presence and says that their, their presence at the time is also sort of deeply resented. Um, it certainly is by some, of course, you know, the um, Ronins, again, those opposed to their presence. Um, but whether that's true in a broad sense is questionable. Again, lots of the merchants, lots of um, those who make their living off their presence or certainly make some money off their presence are certainly not opposed to it. Um, again, you can also argue the shogunate itself is not so fussed or concerned about their presence, certainly not as much as the Meiji government is later. Again, this issue itself can be illustrative about changing conceptions of sovereignty, international law, international norms on the Japanese side. So learning about the West or Western systems and adapting them or adapting to them, obviously under duress, and then occasionally using them also to, how should we say, uh, improve their position vis-a-vis -vis the Western powers later. So the arrival of the troops is tacitly approved of, albeit after their arrival in 1864 by the shogunate. Um, again, you could argue, and as I have already, that the shogunate isn't as concerned about their presence um, as a modern state would be, okay? Um, the shogunate, of course, doesn't have a monopoly on armed force. And you might say it's somewhat planned to have help to protect the settlement. Um, again, it's also useful in internal debates that we have a deterrent force here that makes attacking the settlement, attempting to expel the foreigners an entirely different kettle of fish to when there wasn't anybody present. Um, helps to unravel expulsionist sentiment or move that over into the kind of rich country, strong army vein, you might say. Um, that said, the shogunate isn't in really in a position to resist. 
who can't really say, no, we don't want these individuals here, get rid of them, because that would trigger a conflict, of course. So perhaps it makes the best of a bad situation, makes use of what these troops can offer it, but again, it's not, how should we say, able to expel them, or uh, it may be sort of able to see the usefulness and value of them later, but it's not necessarily or isn't capable of stopping them arriving. Um, again, for others, particularly foreigners, the presence of foreign troops is an indication of the failure of shogun on policy or even the shogun itself, because it can't provide for their security and or keep its international commitments. So because you're not doing what you're meant to be doing, we have to do this. Um, so it kind of could be argued to devalue um, should we say the image of the shogunate amongst some having to have these troops present um into the Meiji era though as i've mentioned the, the presence of these troops becomes something how should we say more uh which is paid attention to a little bit more okay again as the Meiji government learns more about western international norms um it sees the presence increasingly as a symbol of inequality and compromise sovereignty. So it becomes a point of contention. And again, the issue was raised um, by Iwakura, of course, on his visit, on his mission, a part of his mission in the UK. Um, and eventually, of course, this leads to the withdrawal of the troops uh, in 1875. Again, as we come to here. So moves were considered from the early 1870s um, about removing them. Of course, the situation internally in Japan is more settled, but it's not entirely peaceful by, you know, 1871, 1872. Um, Parks, again, varies in his thinking, but argues for their retention uh, for quite a while. But ultimately, both the British and French garrisons leave in 1875. Even then, though, the foreign community isn't really very happy about that. It would rather they stayed. Um, by this stage, you might say, though, their concern is more the loss of kind of social engagements. Again, the, the kind of core of the life of the party, you might say, in a sense, for a lot of their social activities, especially on the more elite level, is leaving. Um, so they regret that. Although, again, they do state, again, these articles in the newspaper, or newspapers plural, saying that they'll miss the kind of protection awarded, afforded by their presence. Um, Again, there's different arguments why they go. Of course, there's the diplomatic angle. Um, again, the value of doing that in other negotiations going on at the time with the major government. But also cost is a factor. So again, Morton, Daniels, others talk about this. Again, other issues to do with their health, um, particularly the kind of SDI side of things also mentioned by Morton, but again, that's endemic inside British troops wherever they are in the world. It's not just um, in Yokohama. What I would maybe add to this is that this isn't a one-off they were drawn. It's not entirely Japan related. Um, again, Cardwell's whose reforms are going through uh, the British Army from this at this stage or being carried on anyway by his successor. Um, I look to withdraw a lot of imperial troops from around the empire, uh, except in wartime, to withdraw, you know, reduce costs, reduce local impact. Um, and again, the army is facing, or the government is facing a massive increase in military costs to buy all the officers out of the value of their commissions, because the abolition of the purchase of commissions has, has gone through following Cardwell's reform. So there's other concerns here it's not just the direct cost there's sort of background issues um also again with things coming down the taiping rebellion of course being over uh, matters in japan becoming more settled with the major government of course bedding in but of course you still have rebellions later on and other various different things um it's not seen as so essential to have them present in the region so hence their withdrawal, or another reason for their withdrawal. So legacies, well, of course, the cultural ones, the sports, 
um, the music to Kimi Gaio, not the poem that's ancient, but the, the sounds come from Fenton. Um, again, the force also contributes directly and indirectly to other trends. So you could argue that these experiences, um, again, of course, Kagoshima, Shimonoseki are also playing a big role, the opening of Japan itself, the black ships and Perry of military power, again, rich country, strong army, right? Being a base indicator of modernity and security for Japan. Um, again, links to later militarism, the evolution of those ideas, or some elements of the evolution of those ideas. Again, other legacies of the training. Um, again, as I've mentioned, it's disputed by some, certainly the direct impact. Um, and again, you might even say maybe temporary impact, because once the French drill instructors come in, their methods and their approaches, their drill takes over. So there's a kind of little interregnum or a little kind of informal period where British drill is used and is, you know, influential to an extent in certain contexts and certain areas, but that's soon overwritten by French and then later German drill. Um, but there's still an influence there. Again, Choshu, Satsuma, abandoning violent opposition to encroachment or the presence of Westerners, again, abandoning their expulsionist sentiment. Again, you could frame that largely as a result of Kagoshima and Shimonoseki, again, the latter of which the value of modernized infantry marines, of course, actually in this case, marines from the garrison is clearly demonstrated. So they play a role in those broader trends, in those broader changes. Um, again, their arrival and maybe more importantly, departure represent key stages in the compromising and then eventual recovery of sovereignty uh, by Japan. Okay, after they leave, no more foreign troops are garrisoned in Japan until 1945, where again, interestingly enough, they land first, of course, there's some come by air, but land first by sea in Yokohama, okay, same place. Again, we could talk about Japan as a victim of imperialism. Again, the interactions with Gaiatsu or this Joy narratives, um, expulsion narratives. Um, also, yeah, I believe I've kind of talked about expulsion already, haven't I? Uh, so to conclude anyway, um, I certainly think that it's a topic of interest and one that's worth highlighting. Um, again, worthy of attention, well, akin to that, maybe not equal to that, of course, shown to the merchant and diplomatic sides, but still worth looking at. Um, again, as I've said, multiple influences, some of which have been recognized, um, but often underplayed or abstracted from the garrison. So if we talk about the culture of the treaty port, where they don't say one of the key drivers or maybe the key driver of that. And again, the core of the population, of course, the vast majority of the population at certain times is actually this force. Um, again, taking into account the size of the force and the insecurity of life in the port, it could lead us to argue and re-examine the early years of the treaty port as one of, well, it can be more potentially accurately described as a tense and occasionally violent imperial military cantonment rather than a kind of flourishing cosmopolitan pageant of the UQA or Yokohama, I suppose they are. Um, or again, as some sort of images of the, the life of the port present. Um, again, the force, as I've mentioned, is not used actively really in military operations, certainly not planned at military operations. Anyway, they're attacked, of course, several times um, after Shimonoseki, um, but their presence has a passive or indirect impact. So I would say deterring aggression, promoting a sense of security for the foreign community, and again, influencing affairs in Japan. So perhaps we could say the invisibility of the thin red line here, the garrison is maybe indicative of its strength, um, or one of its strengths. It doesn't have to be used because it's effective in deterring aggression, which is what it's put there for in the first place. Um, again, it influences matters without needing much usage and provides much of the background 
again, to life in the port and the security which helps sustain it. So the garrison gives space and time for the diplomats and traders to practice their work, their professions, and security to practice those professions. So very finally, again, thin red line, of course, the painting here, Robert Gibb. Um, again, before we have any comments, I know that the actual phrase that's written is, is not the thin red line, it's a thin red streak tipped with steel. Um, again, the Highlanders, the Battle of Balaclava is where that phrase comes from. Um, if we think about, again, some scholarship connected to this topic, again, Oslin talks about um, the Shogunate basing its negotiation on a series of barriers, negotiation with the foreign powers, again, negotiation with imperialism is the title of his work, physical, social, economic and cultural blocks or barriers it tries to kind of erect, even inside Japan after the treaty ports have been opened to greater encroachment, greater involvement um, by the Westerners in society, um, etc. cetera. Um, managing the relations with the treaty powers in that sort of space that it generates or limits for them to operate inside of. Um, we could argue that the French and British garrisons, so maybe a thin red and blue line, I suppose, if we're being more accurate, or a purple one, although the blue line sounds more like police, so Maybe we'll stick with the red and not give the French the credit. Um, again, their garrison is much smaller, so it's principally the, the British one is the, the important one. Um, anyway, we could argue that garrisons also represent a form of barrier thrown up by the treaty powers, maybe even sort of inside of that, applied by the shogunate, around the treaty port of Yokohama in particular. A protective barrier, a kind of deterrent which passively, in terms of defense, deterrence, policy influence, and actively, so through patrols, fortifications, defense, seeks to prevent violence, action against foreigners, or closing the treaty port. So this interestingly kind of simultaneously reinforces elements of the shogunate's barrier, or some of them, but it also challenges some of the others. So it helps you might argue indirectly the shogunate maintains certain forms of security, but its cultural and economic influences undermine some of these barriers. Um, again, the line also perhaps indicates the limits and limited nature of British and French ambitions. Um, this far and no further. We're not looking to colonize this country. Um, we want to protect trade and protect our citizens, and that's that. Um, the red line being sufficient and a way to prevent the necessity of greater involvement later. Um, again, counterfactual or speculation, but you know, if more murders are, were committed against the foreign community, or again, if a major attack was committed, if somebody decided to try and take the idea of expulsion seriously, it could have resulted in a much greater involvement of foreign troops and potentially a much greater infringement of Japanese sovereignty. Um, or even again, it was very unlikely, of course, in this case, colonization. So the red line here preventing Japan becoming pink. Um, so and finally, once the Japanese can guarantee the security of the foreign community, you could argue the garrison, the thin red line becomes redundant. Um, again, into the Meiji era, it becomes less and less necessary um, and actually more and more counterproductive, even a barrier itself to good relations, commercial or otherwise, and hence it fades away. And so does my presentation at that point. So thank you very much. Um, again, I'll stop sharing. So. I think this is when we open for questions. I don't know if they're fielded or what the routine is here, but um, fire away. Do we have any, any in text or others? Yes, please go ahead. I, I can, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody all, but I can see one hand up there. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, Joanna. Good morning. Hello. Oh, yeah. nice it's to see good you. to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. And thank you so much for your excellent presentation. I was uh, listening to it and reveling <laughs> in what you were saying. So I, I have a couple of comments. And I was wondering if you could um, expand a little bit more on that. But also, uh, I think congratulations are in due because uh, it's really interesting to pick uh, the specific event. I mean, the, the, the presence of the garrison troops uh, during this period, it's indeed something that is not very studied. So these legacies and this, um, this connection with the local population is something that is very interesting to study. And, and I do think uh, it's, it's a really uh, relevant topic. I was wondering if it's also interesting uh, to study this connection between the, the French and the British uh, garrisons, if there is any more information that could uh, bring light uh, into some other factors. I mean, even in relation with the, uh, the Shogunate, if, if this is also connected to this sort of uh, gunboat diplomacy that Beasley actually mentions uh, in this book, maybe I'm very far off, but maybe you can uh, help me with that. And also this is just um, a curiosity actually. Uh, do you think that after the garrison has left um, in, so during the, the, the Meiji period already, if that can also be used uh, in Japan as a way of promoting their own, so like as a way of propaganda of saying that they have become like a modern state and that they can assure that they are uh, fully into like international uh, diplomacy and sovereignty? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the French and British garrisons relations that in the accounts that I've looked at, they don't, how should we say, um, mix so much. I mean, they mix socially. There's accounts of, uh, you know, uh, eating with one another and the kind of schoolboy French of the, the British officers coming unstuck, like they, they were doing so well up to a certain point saying, oh, we, 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 or whatever, and then it kind of goes off the rails. Um, again, the one way to look at it, this though, is it's sort of interesting that it's like a field of competition between Britain and France. Like neither one of them wants to be the first one to withdraw their troops. And Parks is very, very keen not to allow the French to dominate both the army and the navy of Japan. Um, so it's like a stage on which to compete between the two. Again, at using their influence, um, or is, is it an expression of the influence of the two. Um, again, the French influence or the French kind of military presence, of course, continues to 1875, but it really sort of wanes away after 1871 with their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, in the fall of the Second Empire, etc. But yeah, it's something I'd like to look at more. I mean, again, as I mentioned, I'm not a French speaker. Um, and again, one thing that I certainly like to do, if there's anybody out there in particular who's, again, working on similar topics and has those language skills, or again, is present in Paris, etc. Um, would look to future cooperation with over such in the, you know, medium term, so the Anglo-French elements of it. Um, again, the gunboat diplomacy, yeah, I mean, you can certainly frame this as horror does as a, you know, this is an imperial, and it is an imperial episode. Um, foreign troops being present without really being invited and using their presence to kind of dictate and control space inside of a, you know, non-Western country. So very much so. Again, not just gunboats here, but you've got marines and soldiers present on shore as well so as i said it's a tool it's something that can be used behind the scenes to in, impress or intimidate if necessary um again post-departure is certainly a signal and seen as a signal of japan recovering elements of its sovereignty but that's not really you could say fully complete until much later you've still got you know tariffs and various other elements where um, the foreign powers have an influence and a say over Japan, um, really into the, I think it's 1890s. So, but this is a key stepping stone towards that. We don't have foreign troops present. 
we've of course got lots of foreign you know vessels visiting we've got a royal naval hospital in in yokohama for a bit longer than this and other things so not entirely free of foreign influence but it's yeah very significant step that these guys have gone uh, at least from the japanese perspective you might say so thank you very thank much thank you very much <laughs> all right Okay, um, again, I think I have a message. Anybody else? First of all, I can see and I've got, yes, Roger. Yes, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, very valuable to uh, get a, a perspective of a military historian, um, which we don't often get in, in, in this field and to get a very different perspective. Um, and thank you very much. I've, first I've got three lines of query I'll, I'll pick one and hopefully some others will find find the other two but I'll, I'll, go, I'll go pick for the one which is actually perhaps the more critical um which is about um i wasn't at all sure sometimes who you were quoting and um for example you know you you put terrorism in in single quotes i'm not sure whether you're using the british or the american system whether this is a direct quote of the time or later um as to whose perspective of this you know is, is seeing it in preventing terrorism mm. um um and there were there were various occasions where you try to rep um, represent a broad consensus um what you thought was the broad consensus so like for instance that you thought broadly i think the word was broadly uh, that the the british troops were accepted um uh, or the foreign troops were accepted which i found particularly surprising i mean in uh in my broad take of the history of the time the, the shogunate has lasted 350 years without much trouble and then suddenly we get this expel the foreigners movement which is enough to motivate um, a broad consensus to to remove the, sh the shogunate um, so it, i find that surprising and another comment was um, um, on your conclusion, it wasn't on the conclusions page, but you're, you're narrating it. You said we weren't um, attempting to co to colonize, and who is the we? You know, I, I would have thought um, you couldn't. It'd be hard put to name a British colony where we set foot in India or Africa with the intention of colonizing. I would have, if, if um, you know, mm. there are narratives that is often given on the Japanese side is that their policies were to prevent what they were seeing had happened in so on, so many other places in the globe. Hence, the need to contain the foreign incursions. So, about quotations generally. Anyways, that, that's 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 the general yeah. broad, broad idea. Okay. Yeah. The the first that's Oslin. Terrorism. Um, that was in those ten ten. Um, the marks. When is he? Sorry, is he is he a, a time or, or recently? He's a modern story uh -huh. based in the United States. I see. Yeah, um, I think he was previously based in Japan. The work he I'm referring to there is it, it refers to the attacks on foreigners as terrorism, and I don't necessarily share that the meaning of that word. I don't necessarily think it represents terrorism as we would understand that as a modern term. Um, you're not dealing with, I don't think here, it's not a modern society, as we might term it, you know, you can use pre-modern or early modern, again, there's issues with both of those terms, of course, and maybe not the place to go into them here, but yeah, it, it was in those marks because I don't entirely agree with that term, but it was used for convenience in this space, so that one. Um, Oslin. Uh, again, the broadly accepted um, I suppose maybe we are using biased sources here, but the all three of the accounts that I mentioned, uh, points, uh, our life in Japan and the other, they they talk about their interactions with the local population. And that's almost exclusively positive in terms of dealing with peasants and dealing with merchants and townsmen. Uh, it's not so positive when dealing with members of the samurai class, of course. They talk about, well, I'll give you, they use exactly the same example, two of them. They say, if you see one of them touch his sword, you need to draw a revolver on them immediately, or maybe even open fire on them immediately if they do that, um, because it's taken as a, 
an indication they're going to attack you. Um, again, there's an element of fear, an element of, again, direct confrontation there. But with the other classes of Japanese society that they encounter, it's very much positive. Um, or they view it as positive. How positive is it in reality is another question. Um, yeah, shogunal acceptance. Um, as I've mentioned, it's how far do we judge that when it's something you can't say no to, right? Um, perhaps a better way of framing it from my perspective of my, my argument might have been that they see some advantages in it despite having to accept it, okay? Um, the last point, again, very much I take that. Uh, it's, you know, we talk about the sort of flow of imperial control following trade again, developing in you know, further detail. I mean, if examples maybe of direct colonization or the attempt to colonize, you could talk about certain actions in the 1880s um, in Africa, for example. Um, yeah. So deliberate attempts there, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna colonize these territories to prevent other European powers get them, getting them. But again, I certainly accept your argument that most of the time that's not the direct objective. Um, of particularly British imperial encroachment from the start. It's much more about trade and then things escalate from there. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, and from everything I've seen, there's no realistic or any design or any plans at all to try to colonize Japan. Um, it was more of a kind of, I don't know, whether, not whether it's counterfactual or not, but a way to close it off saying that a potential way to interpret the value of this force or the presence of this force was to prevent greater involvement later on. Um, so hopefully that answers your points. Okay. Um, right, I think we have another one here in the chat. Okay, how much do we know how do we know at all how the presence of the garrison may have influenced Japanese take up of meat eating, e.g. military rations, beef eaters dining out in Yokohama? Um, hmm. That's an interesting one in terms of diet. So you see adverts in the various different uh, treaty port newspapers for provisions. Um, I wonder really, the influence directly people talk about origins of things like gyudon don't they in uh, in yokohama whether that's you know how valid that is and how direct influence is i suppose a market is generated for meat and a lot of that well it's not just them it's the rest of the foreign community you want to consume it and again the the things they hunt the different you know game and the other things they get they consume them as well um but the foreign presence certainly i think stimulates demand for foodstuffs that foreigners are into consuming. Um, so, but yeah, the direct impact of meat consumption. Um, again, they are very much into eating their meat. Um, again, it'd be interesting to examine really. It's another point I haven't quite got to yet. I mean, how much is provided from the fleet, for example, salt beef and biscuits and other things being brought over um, you know, visits by British shipping, etc. Um, I mean, certainly, I think there is some stimulus for it, production of meat and supply of meat from local suppliers, local you know, um, sources, um, and maybe that through supply demand being generated could be something. But um, so far, I haven't encountered any direct dishes or anything that have passed over or such. But yeah, again, thank you. Very interesting question. Um, again, we've got, where are we? So other questions, uh, composition. Um, so by that composition, um, I don't exactly know what you mean. Maybe you can follow up by that in terms of the units or in terms of. Oh, hi, Tom. Hello. Thank you for your fascinating uh, presentation. No I was just thinking about the, the British Commonwealth's occupation of Japan in the post-war period, and the troops were from many different parts of India, including Maharathis, Gurkhas from New Zealand, um, Australia, of course, who were in charge. Um, but 
when you talk about the British Army, you're talking about a, a very diverse uh, group of different peoples from all around the world. So who were the people that the Brit representing or serving in the British Army in Yokohama? Where did they come from? Uh, okay, well, of course, all the, well, the army units are about 40% uh, Irish um, of the men, despite them being, I mean, the Hampshire regiments often higher than that. But uh, yeah, again, they, they really vary, but they're from often the poorest classes of society, well, pretty exclusively from the poorest classes of society, both urban and rural poor. Um, again, very hard lives, very, again, tough situation. Again, a lot of them enlist in their forces to escape criminal prosecution or to escape trouble at home or they are orphans or, you know, very, 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 I mean, in some ways studying this is quite depressing, to be honest with you, the, you know, very hard people, very hard life, again, very hard circumstances um, and very hard violent profession uh, so yeah um very much the kind of working class as we might term them or so urban and rural poor from the british isles and the british units um the only indian army unit that's present is the ballot regiment or ballot regiment um again which is from of course the kind of northwestern frontier zone so what's now pakistan um again they're not present for too long um, again, they are objects of interest from the local community. Uh, questions like why are Indian troops serving the British, etc. Um, in terms of the composition of the officers, well, again, upper class, you know, typical, of course. Um, yeah, officer class. Um, Generally speaking, again, it becomes much more common later on, privately school educated, but um, again, some kind of formal military education becomes more typical later through Sandhurst and other things. But yeah, very much sons of um, well landed or again, well off people. Again, you do get some from different parts of society, um, but it's very much the expectation you're a gentleman um, in terms of manners, speech behavior, etc. Um, and again, you have to have independent means. The salary of a, an army officer isn't really enough to keep him unless he's exceptionally frugal. Um, so you have to have money in order to be of that. In terms of broader imperial uh, contributions, there's, I mean, again, there's members of the Royal Marines from all over the world. Um, but principally, yeah, these are people from the British Isles uh, slash what is now Pakistan in terms of their national con um, national composition. Uh, thank you, anyway, for your question. Yeah, thank you, Tom. All right. Um, right, what else? Uh, examples of game being hunted. Um, yeah, so, I don't know, it's like pheasant, copper pheasant. Um, I'm not an expert on such things, but yeah, game birds principally. Um, I mean, they tried to hunt deer, but there's not really a lot about, and there's even less about once they start hunting them. Um, again, you see similar issues actually later on with the BCOF of hunting and other things going on around. Uh, but anyway, in terms of fox hunting, again, they don't generally do that well. Um, in terms of wolves, I don't know, I'm not a natural historian or a zoologist, whether wolves actually are present in Japan at this stage or whatever, I suppose they're present at some stage, right? But whether they're present in Yokohama, I don't think so. Um, so no, it's, I mean, basically they go for a ride out, some of these officers in the morning, and then if they come across with their hounds, which they brought over or bred, and if they come across some scent or whatever, they go off on a you know, steeple chase trying to find something. Again, I, I know virtually nothing about fox hunting, but, um yes foxes is the game and that's what they're into, into and that's what they're after so okay any others any other questions or comments 
Yes, I have a question about uh, a couple questions here. One was uh, is related to the uh, Beto photographs that you used, yeah, or that you had in your presentation. Um, I was actually just a few weeks ago. I was on an island off of uh, Oita, and there was a Beto photograph of the British naval ships uh, for that. Uh, what was it? The Battle of Shimonoseki. <clears throat> but I was just wondering whether, I don't know anything about Beto, but I saw that photograph and then your photographs and how do his photographs um, kind of give you a, a visual or a, I guess a, a look into the life at that time? Uh, are there a lot of Beto photographs that you are able to look at or how are they kind of helping your uh, approach or image or of that time period. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Beto, he, of course, is, well, relatively well, famous, I suppose, in terms of his production of not just these photos, but photos of the, you know, Second Anglo-China War, aka Second Opium War, and again, photos of the Indian Rebellion or Mutiny. Um, again, there's sets of his photos that were produced for sale and you encounter numbers of them inside of the collections of different regiments that were present here so they've obviously purchased sets of them um, for their own kind of souvenirs or memoirs um, again very interesting very indicative again it's nice to actually see the reality here again of course this is the sort of how should we say this it gives you a kind of direct impression of course of well, not necessarily the reality because they're posed and you know these are very early crude photographs, but yeah, of the context of the situation. Um, again, some of what he produces, particularly in terms of photographs of the Japanese are a bit more kind of, how should we say, stilted or inaccurate, sort of anachronistic clothing and other things for, you know, because they sell for souvenirs to foreigners. So some of these things of, you know, action or, you know, the um, military pictures are, interesting for context but of course they're all posed and some of his other work is not quite so useful or again useful at all really in some ways um, there are though collections of other photographs that are maybe as interesting or more so some of the regiments um, or some of the officers had their own well there's other other photographers present or they had photographs taken so particularly the lincolnshire archives have got an awful lot, lot of photographs um, not just of of Vito's ones, but others, showing a lot more of the living conditions and the mess and other things. So, again, yeah, useful, a bit of context, a bit of colour. Um, yeah, and it's nice as a, you know, as a historian to have something other than a, a paper document in front of one to look at. So, yeah, yeah, they're, they're useful in their way. Uh, uh, my second question, if I may, uh, is is related to your archive research. You were mentioning uh, right, kind of right before you got started or right in the beginning that you weren't able to access uh, some of the things <clears throat> that you wanted, like in Yokohama. But when you do get to go into those places, are you able to, uh, kind of what's, what's your process, I guess, of gathering the information for this? Is it uh, are you literally going through page by page and reading it there, or do they let you take photographs, or how how are you gathering uh, large quantities of data that you can turn into a book? Yeah, I mean it really varies between locations. I mean the Yokohama Archives of History uh, is a great place with lots of material collected all together, but it's relatively expensive for copies and it's also tiresome to do that. So the best thing to do is spend a relatively long period of time going through the stuff in situ and then choosing the, the elements. Um, again, the, the National Archives in the UK is maybe slightly better for doing big chunks of stuff. So this whole, you know, you can order whole documents to be copied again, though it's not necessarily so cost effective. Um, but yeah, some of the other places, I mean, they don't really have like a, the material already digitized or anything like that. So regimental museums, for example, they really require, at least a few of them require a visit and you to go and actually look at this stuff. I mean, it's sort of catalog, but again, there's not a great deal of consistency in it, you know, 
how should we say this, they're not, they're not particularly well-funded places, sadly, in certain cases. So how should we say, they don't necessarily have full-time curators or archivists or things like that. So this also presents some challenges. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to being able to travel one day um, a bit further afield and collect a bit more of this stuff. Um, but I've got mountains of stuff, to be honest, at the moment to get through first. So it's not, you know, fundamentally problematic that I don't have this stuff right now, but it'd be nice to add it in later on when I can. Do you, do you find that the archivists, in particular in Japan, are aware of what's in the collections that you're going through or, or not? Uh, not really. The, the Okama Archives of History is very, very, very well curated and organized. Um, so yeah, they are very good at that. I mean, as I mentioned, two of the works on this um, were produced in association with them. So they're very well aware of what's present. And um, one of the works I mentioned is almost like a guidebook saying where all these different elements and references to it are. So they're one of, okay. to, to be honest, one of the best I've ever seen. Um, again, with the various different, you know, ones I've dealt with in the UK, it really varies. Some are very well aware of it, very well organized. Um, Others, it's, you know, something, you know, please come and have a look and see what you can find. Um, we think we've got some stuff, but we're not too sure. So it really varies. But the, the yeah, Yokohama Archives of History are fantastic. I'm, I'm not being paid to endorse them, by the way. It's not some <laughs> commercial, op well, not that they're particularly commercial, but yeah, they, they are very, very good indeed, um, from my experience anyway, dealing with archives. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Oh, yeah. Roger, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, um, on, on my, my two other things. One of them was indeed about food. Um, and just a pointer, I mean, it might, um, it might be worth looking at the work of Sheldon Garren, Princeton professor. Um, uh, just a few years back, he did a presentation at Cambridge. He started with the opener, same period, 1860s, early 1860s, and produced the amount of meat suddenly being exported out of Kobe. And said, well, you know, the sort of question was, how could you suddenly, from nothing, from a place that doesn't, you know, eat meat at all, produce that? And it's a very interesting story about that there is an existing market of the draft animals, and they prefer, I can't remember which way around it is, in the West, they prefer female draft animals in the, in, in, in the East, it's the opposite. And so there was an organized market. And so suddenly they could produce large amounts of, of beef for, the, for, for mainly passing fleets. But clearly some of this must have been going to the garrisons as well, I would have thought. Mm. Um, so, and all that raised the question of who was handling it. So we, um, we had a question about the composition of the, the garrison, but also, most Japanese would have a, an a, a, a inhibition against handling meat. Uh, and so this would bring in probably a certain class, the brachumin, as well as handling it. So there's also an aspect you can look at there. Um, so yes, I mean, did they bring in food? That's one question. My other question is about cash flow. Um, mm. You mentioned about them the garrison making a profit on the currency but um you know where is the cash coming from in the first place i mean I, I, that immediately brings up the you know the 20th century occupation the americans came in saying the japanese will pay for our occupation and they you know all the laws and regulations were there but the fact was that during the whole period the cash flow out of america to japan was never less than a million dollars a day Mm -hmm. um so yeah um who was paying um you know basically yeah uh, again the food angle yeah very interesting i mean i'm also curious about the drink i mean they are obviously they love a, a tipple so where are they sourcing this from that's another question um of course it's not being produced at all inside of japan at this point so i assume it's all imported but whether there's some later on in particular you know, um, Glover's moves towards the, you know, the Japan Beer Corporation and other things, whether some of the sergeants, mess, drinks, etc., come in inside the country. Again, it'd be interesting to examine. Uh, the cash flow, yeah, I mean, again, they're paid by the government, British government, um, to the best of my knowledge. But yeah, money is made 
again, what would happen is that um, privates, for example, or you know, non-commissioned officers and also uh, the common soldiers would have technically, well, a set salary, of course, every day, but they get a large number of deductions from that. And often down to virtually nothing. They eventually, they were guaranteed a minimum of one pence per day in terms of income. But what this did in terms of the conversion rates is give them a bit more back, as it were. So they had a bit more in hand to spend. And hence, as I mentioned, this gives them some cash to use. Um, not particularly well known for saving it. And again, in this era, what, you know, relatively well known for blowing it on various different things. So again, a I don't say stimulus is the right word, but it's, um, yeah, the, the, the wages anyway initially come from the government, British government, and then again, they are supplemented through this exchange rate um, with the Japanese. Uh, okay, so point, point about wolves, systematically hunted to extinction around this time, but perhaps in remote areas, especially Hokkaido. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so, but yeah, I haven't heard anything about wolves or seen anything about wolves. So I, I assume they've already been hunted to extinction here. Um, so yeah, well, thank you very much for that anyway. Okay, any other comments or questions? Um, I mean, I, if there's no more, I don't know whether it's my my place to end, end this presentation or whether we have any closing comments, but... Um, if there are no questions, I might ask you a couple here. To, to okay, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well so I think, before, I mean, we always run into this, not a problem, but a hurdle, I think, you know, when there's lack of rich in sources. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about if, whether you have any sense or prospects for um, materials or sources that you might use outside of, you know, uh, the officers or uh, who was it? The, I was at Hora, I guess. Mm. Right. So, I mean, it it's very difficult to kind of get sources from, as you mentioned, from the, the soldiers, especially the lower class ones who aren't illiterate. Um, but I wonder if there are kind of any other, maybe not even written sources, you're already kind of using these visual sources as well, but you know, any mm -hmm. kind of popular sources that might give you a sense of, you know, um, common perception of these troops outside of like, if the samurai were kind of hostile to their presence and maybe there was a, I don't know, a different angle that, or a different source that you might find for um, more public opinion. I mean, I don't know uh, mm. if that's a if you're getting a sense or that these kind of materials might exist. Um, and mm. what was my other question? <laughs> um, oh yes. Um, so Rogers kind of picked up on the money question, which I, which I was also curious about, but. Um, uh, I know you're not kind of looking into the French issue yet, um, yet, but I'm kind of curious whether you find um, any kind of similarity or marked difference between uh, British garrison troops presence in Japan and uh, British garrison presence elsewhere uh, in Asia, right? Um, you've mentioned that they were uh, potentially considering working with, uh, what was it, uh, uh, operations in China or Shanghai? Um, but uh, <laughs> this is kind of unraveling your project a little bit further, but uh, I mean, or in different avenues, but uh, do, do you see any kind of market difference between the way they were operating in Japan and Yokohama versus how, they, how um, things might have been handled uh, in different uh, places where the troops were stationed in Asia? Uh, okay. Um, all right, the first thing about materials. So there's various different things we can look at. So, of course, you've got court records, you've got uh, court martial records. So, other things like medical records, um, again, the internal records of the kind of battalions present, and you will see inside of that, how should we say, some of the, I don't know whether they're key events, but the not the voices either, but the presence, the existence of the men rather than the officers. Um, again, their interactions with the local community, various other things. Again, you've got the emergence at this stage of some newspapers, some accounts, of course, also available in Japanese of merchants and others living in the town. So again, there may be some things in there to examine. 
um, to get other perspectives. Um, but as you say, it's a challenge. I mean, they don't, there's not really, I'm aware of any um, great volume of like surviving correspondence or anything like that from these people kind of, uh, you know, the, the soldiers themselves expressing their opinions on X or Y. Again, in the books that I mentioned earlier, there's um, there are comments that are reported, and again, things which the soldiers do and say that are reported by the officers. But again, how true it is to to life is another question. Again, how far they are using these little, you know, slightly condescending things they say to inform or advance their own you know story or narratives is, is difficult to say but yeah there are not workarounds but ways you can find to have at least some you know acknowledgement of the influence of the men or the views of the men um right the garrison is kind of an extension to be honest with you of the garrison in hong kong um again the this movement between the two often when they leave japan they go to hong kong or earlier on they go to shanghai um again in terms of their involvement i mean the, the british troops in particularly shanghai in this era the royal marines in particular are involved in the taiping rebellion they're involved in this sort of exclusion zone around shanghai i think is it 20 miles or so but no troops either you know um Qing imperial or typings are allowed to enter and they get confronted or uh, though again though you've got you know charles gordon and others assisting the the Qing government against the typings as well so there's an interesting difference there but it's certainly a lot more active in terms of the military usage um in china itself um but again the accounts seem to show that the men much prefer being in japan they think it's healthier they think it's they, they seem to be a lot more pleased with the situation again they don't have a lot of very complimentary things to say about the way they're living or their experience in china um i suppose for a lot of them that's experience of active and relatively large-scale warfare whereas their experience in japan is relatively peaceful by comparison um so yeah again it's a moment i thought about adding in um Again, looking at the kind of broader presence of them. I mean, I do look at it already from the sort of lead up to their presence in Japan and where they go afterwards. Um, but yeah, the garrison is very much part of a kind of East Asian or Northeast Asian kind of chain of bases, as it were, stations, as it were. Um, not just the, the Royal Navy China Station, but also the Army, you know, garrison in Hong Kong, garrison in Yokohama. Um, okay. Uh, Right, so what have we got here? So another couple of questions in the text. Um, hmm, concept of diplomacy in the late 19th century. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, another one here, many insights. Thank you very much. Um, okay, yeah. And this person's left, but I will, or have they? Um, questions about tourism, troops engaged in such. Yeah, they, they go off and see what they're allowed to see within the, the distance of the uh, foreign settlement. Uh, it's actually going sightseeing, which gets two of them killed. Um, Lieutenant Bird and Major Baldwin uh, are, are murdered by, well, it's sort of a masterless samurai, I suppose, on a, after a trip to Kamakura. A very popular place to visit is the Daibutsu at Kamakura. Um, points goes down again he visits actually just before they do um, and he's informed later on that some the person who actually assassinates them looks to potentially attack him and his group but it's too large um, and the two of them on their way back from Kamakura are killed so again they they like riding out they like going and visiting the various different villages around um, but yeah often they will go out armed again most of the time when they're in the streets they are armed uh, in case they are attacked. There's a very deep sense of, as I mentioned before, personal insecurity. Um, but yeah, the tourism is something they do. Again, the, the purpose of Richardson's visit, the one who's murdered um, by the Satsuma retainers, is basically tourism. He's come over on a visit from Shanghai 
um, and goes out on a, a ride and is unfortunate enough to get caught up in the, the procession and it is of course killed. So yeah, it's something that they quite often do. Um, I mean, they spend a lot more time riding for fun, I suppose, but they do go off and visit various different locations nearby, as I said, particularly Kamakura. Again, Beto's photos mentioned previously. Um, one of the most famous, most prominent of them is of the Daibutsu at Kamakura. So yeah, it's a big tourist attraction. Okay, any others, anything else?